Praise the Lord. And as people get on and watch, I'm really excited about tonight. So I'm going to open up with prayer. Uh, you can watch this later on, but we're going to have fun. I mean, guarantee you're going to learn some things you haven't haven't found out about. So Father in Heaven, I just ask you just to anoint this time. It's just me in this room and those out there are so excited. I've just been thinking about this all day. So I ask that you and your spirit just move tonight. Your word be your word, not my words. In Jesus' name I pray. So praise the Lord, everybody. It's stuck in your houses and here we are. And uh, we're in, I'm 64 years old. I've never seen anything like this. I lived through uh, the Cuban crisis. I lived through 1968, where we had uh, RFK assassinated and Martin Luther King was assassinated. We had the National Guard on, on our campuses in Kent State and shooting students. We've been through a lot in this country, but we're in a place that I've never seen before. We're all locked in. And I was, uh, I was at someone's house and they were law hunkered in and they were diving into the book of Revelation and uh, it was just, and it just got them so confused and so scared and we just had a long, nice long talk and and uh, so I just want to kind of share something with you and through God's word, I have it right here in front of me so I'm going off my phone, Is I hope you can hear me, but uh, so and if you got questions, write them down in the comments later on. When this is all done, I can go through the comments and and uh, and, 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 and answer your questions. So, the end times, what does it mean? What is it about? And I thought I would take you on a quick trip into the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Chapter 9. If you, and please... Go online or however you have your Bible and find the NL, NLT, the NLT version, New Living Translation. Really easy to understand. And I'm a simple man, tough to read. So it's good for me. If it's good for me, I'm telling you, if you can get it, I can get it. It's a good version. Plus, we'd be on the same page. When I'm reading the words, you would be reading the same words as me. So now, quick background. Daniel, if you don't know who Daniel was, he was uh, a young man. And he had contemporaries at the same time, biblical contemporaries that are in the Bible, mainly uh, Ezekiel and the, the prophet Ezekiel and the prophet Jeremiah. Now, they were much older than Daniel. And when Daniel started reading their writings, he already was in captivity in Babylon. And while reading uh, Jeremiah's writings, he realized that their captivity in Babylon would be for 70 years. And that's kind of where we pick up the story in, in chapter 9. This is a beautiful book. It's the most scrutinized book in the Bible because it is the most precise book in the Bible. And I want to challenge you. I'm, I'm going to challenge you guys tonight. I believe that we're living in a time where more is written in God's word than when Jesus walked on the planet. I really do believe that. I don't want you to, to take my word for it. I want you to be like a good Berean and get in there and dig into the scriptures yourself and, uh, and, and, and check me out. Make sure that I'm uh, telling you what's, what's in here. You know, you can't give anybody anything that you don't have. You got to remember that. So here we go. We're going to jump into the book of Daniel Chapter nine. Let me step, set the stage. He went into he went into Babylon when he was a little kid. Now he is an old man. He has been there sixty seven years, and he knows that they're going to be there another three before the, the people can go home. Now, can you imagine? Here is this old man. He went young. So Jerusalem was destroyed, Israel was destroyed, a wasteland. All the Jews were Hebrews were spread around the whole entire world. Daniel's in Babylon, which is modern day Iraq, and uh, he's, and you notice it ain't the seventieth year. He's screaming out to God in the beginning of this chapter, 
if, as you read this chapter, I'm not going to start from the beginning, but if you have read it before and you read down to where I'm going to get to, you can see the intensity in this man's prayer. Don't forget us here. Here, we have been stuck here. Don't forget us. And we pick up in verse 18, he says, Oh my God, lean down and listen to me. Open their eyes. See our despair. Our holy city bears your name, lies in ruins. Let me make this plea, not because I deserve help, but because of your mercy. So here he is. He's crying out to God about Jerusalem. And he said his time, if you read it, it's at the time where he is supposed to be having his prayers. And he's and he is crying out, don't forget us here. Don't forget us here, Lord. And God shows up. God shows up. He sends an angel. He sends the archangel Gabriel. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm praying and God shows an angel, how incredible can that be? And if you... So we're going we're gonna to pick up here at verse 20. As I went on praying and confessing my sins of my people, there's something we should do here, church. Confess our sins, right? How can we stand before a lost world when we're living just like them? Remember that. So pleading with the Lord, the God of Jerusalem, from his holy mountain, as I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in an earlier vision, swiftly came to me at the time of sacrifice and explained to me, Daniel, I have come to give you the insight and the understanding. The moment that you began to pray, a command was given, and here I am to tell you how precious you are to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the understanding of this vision. So here he is. Praying for Jerusalem, praying for his people. The angel shows up. Gabriel shows up. Can you imagine? Now, we got to pay attention a little bit, okay? Because here is the one who always brings the message of Messiah. Gabriel is the harbinger of the Messiah. Gabriel is the one who showed up to Mary. Gabriel brings the message of the Messiah. So he shows up to Daniel, and he's and this is you got to understand the the, the 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 Hebrew, the Jewishness of this. Okay, so he sets in verse twenty four. He says this: a period of seventy sets of seven, which is like here in our time a decade. We call a decade ten. Ten years is a decade. In in this period of time, a set of seven was a set of seven years. So he says that it's been a 70 sets of seven to decree the time for your, for your people and to, and to finish their rebellion, put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, and to bring ever-loving righteousness, confirm the prophetic vision, and anoint the most holy place. So that's 490 years to take care of everything start to finish for his people, his chosen people. Now, we, I, I like when I witness a lot, I say, can, you know, can you show me uh, where God, can you show me where God is? And people say, no, I can't show you. I said, I know, because he chooses you to reveal himself to. And then he gives you the faith to believe it. It's this amazing thing. But if you buy that logic, it takes you straight to the Jew, the, the Hebrew person, he chose them. He chose them. And now we have to take a little quick sidebar of why he picked Abraham. He picked this man, Abraham, because of his faith. He had, he, he had a, a brother that was an idol maker. And he said to his brother, how can you make, cut down a tree and shave it into an idol? Worship the creation and not the creator. And God saw something special in that man. He said, you know what? I'm going to create my people. I'm going to choose my chosen, where I can give them this word, this word where it blesses us to this day, and to reveal myself to this 
world through them. You hear me, church? God picked the Jewish people, chose them, chose them. And to what? To give them the word, stewards of the word, and to reveal themselves to the world, to reveal himself to the world through them. I want you to think about that. I want you to keep keep your eye on that on that prize. Okay, <clears throat> so here the angel says, four hundred and ninety years to, but he breaks it down into three sets, three sets of time. So I'm gonna here I'm gonna go I'm gonna pick up at verse twenty five. He says, now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven, 49. So a set of 49 years, plus 62 sets of seven, which is 434, which brings you to a total of 483 years. It says, will pass until a command is given to rebuild. Let me pick up where I'm at. Sorry, I lost my... Uh, so now listen and understand, seven sets of, of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass. From that time, a command is given to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem is now flattened. There's no temple. There's no city. The Jews are all over the world. And Daniel's praying, don't forget us. The angel's saying there's a time coming when a decree is going to be given to rebuild those city walls, that city of Jerusalem, those gates. And when that time, that decree is given, you can start the clock. You can start the clock. And then 483 years, and if you do the 360-day math, it comes out to 177,880 days. Guess who shows up on that date? Jesus on that little donkey. We call it Palm Sunday. We call it Palm Sunday. But I'm going to show you something here. Just give me a minute. It says, so then it says this. It says, after that period of 62 sets of seven, or the anointed one would be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. So the Messiah is killed appearing to accomplish nothing. Then a ruler will arise, destroy the city and the temple. The end will come like a flood and the war and the misery is our decreed from that time to the very end. Hmm. Did you just pick up what happened there? So, just quickly, I want to show you if I can quickly find, I think it's the book of Nehemiah. I don't know if you, how often you've been in the book of Nehemiah, but Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the uh, Babylonian king. And the book cupbearer is the one who tastes the food, drinks the wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned. So you really had a good relationship with the king. And he, they're back now building the city of, of Jerusalem. The Jews were let back in. A guy by the name of Ezra took them back and he was going to rebuild the temple. And while they were rebuilding the temple, they were fighting off their enemies. And they could not they could not do it while they, were, they needed city walls. So he asked his friend Jeremiah if he could go to the Babylonian king and make a decree or what we call today, make a deal, get some money and to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Well, here you go, believe it or not, right in Jeremiah chapter two, it says early in the spring morning of the month, it gives the exact date in the Bible when this event happens and the king Artaxerxes signs a decree giving money to Nehemiah to take back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Start the clock, as Gabriel said. So now, again, as I say, you start the clock off in this year of the 12th year reign of Artaxerxes brings you to uh, 32 AD. Jesus on the little donkey riding into Jerusalem, which we're going to get to in just a second. 
So, but we see that the clock stopped there. So let me go back to Daniel chapter 9. It says, a ruler will make a tree. Back, 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 back. So the end of verse 26, it says, the end will come like a flood. It's war, misery is decreed until the time of the end. So the temple will be destroyed. When, when, when was the temple destroyed? You got to do your math. Now, you got to look back in history. Well, it was 70 AD. The Romans, uh, by mistake, actually caught something on fire inside the temple. The temple caught on fire. The roof was uh, made with uh, pounded gold and it melted down into the cracks and the Roman soldiers undid every stone to get the gold. So we can see from the time that Jesus was crucified on the clock, it says the anointed one would be killed, appearing to accomplish nothing. Then we have a period of 30, 38 years until the temple is destroyed. So the clock stopped. Now, here we see when we pick up verse 27, it says a ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. So there's a treaty that's going to be made that starts off the last seven. We know that period lasts at least 38 years. And I want you, this is an interesting little sidebar with the 38. Uh, I think John chapter 5, Jesus heals a man lame for 38 years, laying in, uh, on the, in, the, in the dirt. 38 years. Jesus comes by, heals him. Guy gets up, goes into the temple to go give temple sacrifices for his healing. Jesus literally follows him inside and tells the guy, that doesn't work anymore. And if you continue to try that, something much worse is going to happen to you. And that scripture always drove me crazy. I said, what could be worse than laying in the mud for 38 years? So, but if you go back now, Jesus was crucified in April of 32 AD, which is coming up pretty soon, the resurrection. And uh, yeah, 38 years is, is 70 AD when the temple was burnt down. And that is much worse for the Jews because at that point, they had no temple, no place for their sacrifice, no place for the atonement of sin. And then in a few short years later, the Romans wiped out the city, actually buried it underneath, buried it underneath. So I'm going to take you now to a mystery. Now jump over to the New Testament real quick. And I'm going to go to, and get ready for this church, because this ain't going to be fun. I'm going to tell you this, that when I get going here in, in a couple seconds, it may hurt a little bit. But I think you need to hear this. I think we all need to hear this. Because if you look, excuse me, I'm going to jump back to chapter 9. It says, between verse 26 and verse 27, that little, between those two verses, a parenthesis of time, is the entire church age. Every bit of it. The entire church age. Right there between verse 26 and verse 27 in the book of Daniel. A parenthesis, a parenthesis in time, because this thing is about the Jews. God's made promises to his chosen people who are accountable to him. We have been chosen. We are accountable. We are accountable. They also are accountable. And some of them don't believe it. Most of them are atheists. But guess what? That doesn't change the price of potatoes. God loves them and God has a plan for them. And God's going to restore them back to his, as his people, as his chosen ones. This is the word. So right there between verse 26 and verse 27 is the entire church age. Now let's scoot back to Romans. Verse 25, Paul, amazing man, can't wait to meet him in heaven. Just incredible man. Can you imagine every place he went, every town that he went in there and he didn't collect any money. He worked side by side. And at night he preached the gospel. And when he left that town, a bunch of Judaizers would come back in and, hear, and say, you know what, that Paul is nice, but what you have to do is be Jewish first. You got to be this and this and this. 
Can you imagine the frustration that this man went through? He had no relationships with the disciples at all. He had a couple interviews, the encounters with Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. But Jesus called this man himself, period. Just got to understand that. So, verse 25. And by the way, Romans 9, 10, and 11. It's all about the Jews. Jews past, Jews then, Jews now. <laughs> right? I'm telling you, read it for yourself. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 of the book of Romans. This is chapter 11. And he says this. I want you to understand this mystery. Now, if you read that in the Bible, that should perk you up. I want to know what the mystery is, right? Wouldn't you want to know what the mystery? How about this? It says, dear brother, get ready for this. Dear brothers, I want, to tell, I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you do not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the peoples of Israel have hard hearts, but this will only last until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. So all of Israel will be saved, as the scripture says. The one who rescues will come from Israel, from Jerusalem, and he will turn Israel away from their ungodliness. And this is the covenant with them, and I will take away their sins. Now, did you pick up the mystery? I want you to understand this mystery, that you do not feel so proud about yourself, church, that you don't feel so proud about yourself. Because some of the Jews, their hearts were made hard, right? They were made hard. So I want you to read this. I'm going to read a scripture to you. This is in out of... Uh, Luke, chapter 19. This is that day, that 1,700, 1,880th day from the prophecy back in Nehemiah. Jesus is on that mountain. He's got that little donkey. He made that happen himself. He knew that was in the book of Zechariah. That here comes the king riding on a donkey, even a donkey's colt. And he's up there ready to make the ride into Jerusalem. And he starts to cry. He can't believe it. All the prophets, all his word, everything that had ever had been pushed onto his people was for this very day. This very day. They were ready. John the Baptist, the, the, everything was prepared for him and for his people. He wanted his people to come to him, but they knew he would be rejected. He knew it. But he stood there. And I'm going to read it to you. It says, Jesus as he came closer to Jerusalem, he saw the city ahead, and he began, he began to weep. Give me a second. How I wish today, you, you Jews, my people, would have understand the way to peace, but it is too late. Now, this is four days before the crucifixion, because he had to be inspected as the Passover lamb. He had to be made sure he was spotless. But here, four days before, he says, it is too late for you and the rulership of the nation of Israel. Peace will be hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls. They will encircle you. They will close on you on every side. They will crush you into the ground. You and your children, your enemies will leave not one stone in place because you did not recognize the time that God visited you. Can you understand? There is the prophecy. Jesus has already told them back in Daniel that the, the temple was going to be destroyed. Jesus is telling them the temple is going to be destroyed in just 38 years. They were judged right then. Their hearts were made hard by God. Can you understand that, church? For us, this is one of the mysteries. This is a mystery where we don't feel so proud about ourselves. That these people have to go through what's about ready to happen. 
the, this Daniel's 70th week, this period of being restored to him and God revealing himself through his people. It's going to be very difficult. You should read the book of Zechariah and what's down the road for them. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, the time of Jacob's trouble. These things are coming. These things are coming. It's written. It's, that we're in a time like no other. Like no other. So in here, I'm going to scoot over to... So there is that part of the mystery. And I believe it's right here. The full number of Gentiles. The full number of Gentiles. That is the Lamb's Book of Life. That's all of us from the time of the cross and time when this is turned back to the Jewish people. That is those names. That's a finite period of time. If you live between that period and that period, because God lives outside time, he knows the decision that you're going to make because of his foreknowledge. He's going to give you... That's why I love... I made a prayer long ago because I was spinning my wheels with witnessing that, I, that God would just bring me those into my life whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I'll lift you up. I'll, I will tell you about it. And, and ever since I made that prayer, my whole life has changed about how to share the guys. I just can't tell you. So that's a good prayer to make. If you'd like to witness, and because your flesh, your flesh can get tied up in that, trust me. But God wants to bring you to those who, who are ready, who have a heart for him. And, and if you just make that prayer, it'll make that navigation really easy for you. That is the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the fullness of Gentiles. So there's a time coming that that book is closed. That book is closed. And this thing turns back to the Jews. Because if the Jews rebuild their temple... Because if we go back to Daniel, Daniel 9, I know it's here somewhere. It says a ruler will come that will set up a treaty. Now, I don't, I don't want to get out there on a limb, but there's a treaty has been made. There's a, a peace treaty has been made and delivered. But Israel right now is in uh, a dilemma. They're in the midst of their fourth election. They've had their third election, which was unprecedented, and still didn't come up with a, a, uh, a majority. So now they're going to probably have to go into a fourth uh election and with and something's going to have to give someone's going to have to say something and, and that's why this coronavirus thing is is kind of putting a lockdown on everything which is because it takes you your eyes off of everything else that's going on and but they're they're going to have to go into another vote and in this country, there was a great slogan that about building something in this country in 2016 that caught on pretty good, build that wall. So I can see Jerusalem and Israel with the next election moving in to build that temple. And if they go into building a temple again and go back into sacrificing, where does that leave the church? It doesn't leave the church anywhere because God's going to be turning his focus back on him in Revelation chapter 4, Thess 1 Thessalonians ch chapter 4, uh, four about verse 15, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're all going to heaven. We're the harpazo. We're, God's going to take his people out because we're, we're not part of this. We're part of a, a mercy. We're the most merciful. God's shown the most mercy on us ever. We've, we've got grace. We believe. Those Hebrews, they don't need to have, they stood at the Red Sea. They saw it part. No faith involved there. They know there's a God in heaven. Yep. Yeah. They got to go through this. God's got to refine them because his word has to be fulfilled. His word has to be fulfilled. And I'm going to take you to uh, the book of Acts. Let's see if I can find it real quick. 
the book of Acts, chapter 15. So, this thing and what's about ready to happen on the planet is about restoring God's people to a relationship with him. So, like I, like I said earlier, Paul really didn't have a great relationship with the disciples. And they were hounding him all the time. So finally, he, him and Barnabas just went to Jerusalem to have a meeting. They had to have a meeting. They had to lay this out. They were telling these people that <clears throat> they were putting this Jewish yoke on them, circumcision, all kinds of stuff that Paul says that, heck, you guys couldn't do this. Why are you trying to put it on the Gentile church? So he, he, they go there and they kind of really have it out. And I'm going to get down to about verse, uh, he's, it's about verse 12. It says, everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told their, about their miraculous signs and the wonders God had done among them through the Gentiles. When they had finished, James stood up. Now, James wasn't a disciple. The James was the leader of the Jerusalem church, which was the, the, the brother of Jesus, the, the next oldest one, which is a real miraculous sign because Jesus took the responsibility of his, taking care of his mother from James right at the cross. Because remember, James, had, when Jesus was alive, they had no relationship whatsoever. But after the resurrection, obviously, Jesus knocked on the door and James became the leader of the uh, Jerusalem church. And you can read the book of James. He, he had a whole a hard time with Paul's mission and, and message of grace because Again, can, can you imagine growing up for, for all those years, having the Messiah as your brother and you, you didn't even realize it or didn't accept it or whatever. And now you, you can understand why his frustration, he became pretty, well, so let's just read what he said. He says, he says now listen to me, listen to me. Peter as was told about the time when God first visited the Gentiles and the people himself. And this conversation of the Gentiles was exactly what the prophets had written. It says, but he goes in, afterwards I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. And the rest of humanity will seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All of those I have called will be mine. The Lord has spoken. He made all things known to long ago. So James gets up and says, I understand, but he's coming back. He's going to restore his temple. Know why? The book says that God is going to come and reign on this earth. Yeah, it's in the book. He is going to come. At the end of that seven years, he's going to bring the final judgment. So what is that last seven years about? One, to restore his people. Ezekiel 37, 38, 39. Back into a, a loving relationship with them. But it's not going to be easy. Number two, judge the nations and how they treated his people. I want you to think about that. How they were treated. There's some countries that, boy, oh boy, those countries are in big trouble. I'm telling you, you read the book, it's, it's filled with, that judgment is coming. So you should be thankful, church. You live in an area of grace. But there's God's chosen, have to go through it. It's in the book. But God's going to bring them out on the other side as his precious possession. And he is going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem and rule this planet. It's going to be very exciting. We're going to be with him. We're going to be with him. Matter of fact, when this period starts, chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, we're in heaven, singing and dancing. So remember that. God bless you guys. I'm going to read the comments. I just Thanks for jumping in. I appreciate you. And I'll see you next Tuesday. Out.